to go back. Start at seven o'clock, okay? Can you hear me through uh, the laptop or does it sound uh, clear like I've got the headset on? Um, does anyone want to say? Oh good. I hope that you're all doing all right. I hope um, your revision's gone well. Um, I'll be getting in about seven tomorrow. Uh, so I guess if any of you are there from 7.30 and just want to do a rundown of things that you go over tonight before the exam, just uh, let me know, all right? <laughs> So I think what would be a good thing for me to go through with you guys first is probably to go through uh, the database presentation that I did before because some of you uh, struggled with that when we went over it. But I'm also going to go over the little man computer uh, and I've got the instructions that we had in the previous task. And I've got lots of... Uh, old resources and paper here so if you ask any questions and you can't quite remember stuff just uh, like I said let me know Right, so what I'll do is I will talk a little bit and flip back to this. So I might not see the live chat, I might not see some of the messages, uh, but I'll take breaks in between them so that you can ask questions uh, or if there's something that you wanted me to just run through. Uh, yeah, um, I haven't got network slides, but what I'll do is I will go over some things and you can write some stuff down. If, will that be helpful? So what I'll do is, uh, when I get to a certain point, I will go over, in fact, I'll open up some of the previous uh, networking presentation. Let me just search for some of that on this computer. Who's that? It's not that one.
yeah, I've got I've got a few lessons still on here for networks that that I can go through for you. Okay. Right. So uh, let's uh, get this going. So one of the areas that you said that you wanted to look at first. Uh, in fact, I'm going to open up a Word document as well. So let's. Yep, that's the very first thing I'm doing. Little man computer T style. All right. Uh, but I'm going to open up a Word document so I can type some things uh, that I say as well. <laughs> right, guys. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do is actually open up the presentation that I want to do. With you that would help. Right. So the little man computer. If you remember that when you are a computer programmer, you need to get to grips uh, with something called uh, assembly code. All right. Now, there are low-level programming languages, and one of these low-level programming languages is assembly language, otherwise known as the little man computer. So remember, this is called assembly code. All right. Now, the little man computer is examined, and you'll be expected to know how to use this, and you'll be expected to maybe write a program and explain what each of the different things do. Now. Most programming languages like Python are written in high level, uh, but what they do is when you use the compiler or the interpreter, they are converted into machine code. Now, assembly code is known as low level language, okay? Now, it basically, it, it represents a machine code instruction, and this means that programs often run much longer. Now, the thing with the little man computer is that it has its own instruction sets. So what you can see here is you've got add, which basically means it's going to add. Uh, we've got subtract, store, load. You've got branch, which is basically branch always. There doesn't need to be a condition with that. All right. You've also got branch if zero. So generally you'd use that after you have subtracted something. So if you had to subtract two numbers, uh, so uh, what you can see here is you've got store number 99, but if you did uh, subtract 99 from that, then you do a branch because you could say branch if zero. Uh, then you've got branch if positive, so if you subtract that and you end up with a positive number, you can say which piece of data that you go to, all right? Uh, then you've got input, which will put it into an address, uh, output, halt, which you usually always do at the end of the program, and data. Now what I'm going to do on my blank Word document is just type an example of a program here. So this program would add two simple numbers together. So imp store num1, okay, imp add num1 out in fact I'm going to indent this so you can see it better and num1 dat okay so that's like your your storing point so that is a simple program now the first line means input a number okay the second line is that it's it's going to store the contents of this into accumulator. All right. Next, it wants an input again, but then what it's going to do is it tells the computer to add whatever is stored at that current location. whatever is stored at this location is added to the number one. All right, so the third line means another number is input. The next line adds, the, tells the computer to store whatever is that in that location. All right, so it's gonna add. All right, so it's gonna add the second number. And finally, out outputs the contents with the numbers that we've added, okay? Now, what you need to remember to do all right, and I'm going to give you an example uh, of another example here. So what I've got is 
input ask for a number all right then I'm going to store number one so it's going to store that number in think of it like a variable so I've stored whatever I input into the cum accumulator into a variable so that's what's basically happened there so that makes more sense to you then it says load hundred okay I'll explain what this does in a minute subtract number one from what's in the accumulator and output it now what we've got here is hundred I'm gonna in All right, 100 is your variable name, and that, that is saying that I have a variable, so that's the name of it, that's basically the variable, and I've that's the value that's stored in there. Number one is basically holding the data. So what happens here is, it asks for a number, say for example I've entered 55, it stores 55 in number. All right, so 55 is now stored in num1. Then it says load 100 into the accumulator. All right, so we've now got 100. Subtract 55 and output that. Now, what you can do after that is you might say, uh, this is where you can, so if I sub do, let's load 100, subtract 55, I can say, branch if positive okay and say where to go uh, I'm gonna say number is positive okay and then what I've got is I've actually got a label for number is positive so it will go to that label and I could have a number in that example or I could get it to load uh, number one again. So you can choose what to do there. Uh, I'm just going to go back and check if there's uh, any questions. Alright, uh, so there may be other people in here. But Who's playing Minecraft? <laughs> This is AS only, um, uh, sorry to say. Uh, if you uh, whoever, um, if you are struggling to keep up, you can replay this video. But I did say to my students that they can they can only uh, uh, they only need to give up an hour of their time. So I've got a lot to get through. Uh, but at the end of this, the video will be saved, so you can watch back over it. Okay. Uh, any questions on the little man computer from my students? I'll just give you a minute. Uh, you can replay this afterwards. Brilliant. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do then is go on to the next topic, which I have on here. All right, uh, which is right. So this I am going to go through quite quickly, but it, like I said, we just want to recap over it. Now you might get asked in the exam question how information is captured. Now remember when we did the uh, Kahoot in the lesson the other day, uh, you were a lot of people were wondering about uh, what the difference between a report and uh, a, a form is. Well, when we are using a database management piece of software, usually it has a front end on it, such as Microsoft Access, which allows you to actually use it. Now, with these programs, you can have forms, and remember, forms are they could be interactive in in the sense of you open up a document uh, online and you have to type in the data so that's how that works now what you need to be aware of is that there are different ways to select information now some of the information you've got SQL so remember SQL is used 
to sample the information, it is your query. Now, in general, I haven't seen a question come up yet where you are expected to write the SQL, but saying that, it will be the one time it does come up, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over uh, databases and SQL with you and I'm going to show you some examples of SQL code. So first thing that you've got is this is a simple query and what that allows you to do is if you need to select name, at gender and date of birth that's only going to show those three pieces of information name, gender, date of birth. So that's the only information that will appear from your table animals when the gender is female okay so that's a simple query that will only bring up uh, three columns of information or three fields these are your fields remember alright now the next thing that you need to be aware of so I will just load this up I've got this written here is when you're doing a query, so I'm going to do this again on here to demonstrate this. All right. Select is how you select the information, okay? Now, what you might do is say select, and this is where you type in your field, whether it's age, name, date of birth, okay? I'm going to break this down from that's your table alright so you select the information you want to find from the table and then that where is where you put your criteria select from where remember those three things now if I needed to select name from student where name equals Ray that's going to show only the student now what you can also do is you can use wildcards such as star which show all, everything. Now there are different types of queries available just to remind you. You have create which is used to create a table so you can say create create table obviously I'm talking about the name of your table there create table you can go insert so you can into so you can insert information now if you want to remove uh, a whole table you so to remove a table in the query you just go to drop table all right obviously that's your table name again remember you can replay this video now if you are doing a query where you want to delete information you can do delete from table name where name equals Ray and that would just delete out of that table. All right, so that's query based language. I know that's a quick run through but we I have uh, given you these slides before and we have done notes. Now query by example that's basically where you find the information in the database and it's presented with you've seen this in access before all right this is basically uh, you can actually see the data tick boxes and run the query okay now good feature these are features that you need to be aware of so features of database management systems is that they maintain integrity so remember what I said uh, about data integrity if you have tables linked together the information is kept consistent so if I was to remove a customer from the table all of the orders that go with that customer will be removed as well you can use command language with it so I've just talked about SQL you can document the ex the data that's inside it by creating a data dictionary. You can also I'm just going to go uh, down to this one support the ability to v to view the database from different viewpoints. So, for example, I might make a front end, or I might make reports or forms. That's what we talked about before. I might make a a report. Think about the reports that go home. They are slightly different for each year group so that they get the data that the parents need to see okay 
Uh, I'm going to go through this quite quickly uh, because we've got a lot to get through. We also have exchanging data, so comma separated values. I'm going to show you an example of that. So this is CSV. So one feature of databases is that you can import or export data easily so that you can use it on other people's databases. So I could import this into another into another company. So CSV allows you to move things around, but the problem is you don't know the data type of each field. Now, if I go back to this slide, I've got the number 100 there. It doesn't mean that that's going to be a text data data type, so you need to be aware of that. It might be quick and easy to use, but sometimes it can cause more problems actually setting up the structure of it. Then we had XML, which looked a little bit like HTML. It uses tags. Uh, for So you can see here that it's easier to structure it. The good thing about it is that when you're setting up the attributes it's a lot clearer and easier and you can interpret the information. If I have to interpret this information I can see straight away that this name is going to be a string, a character and it's and the information that's going in this. Okay, So it's easier as long as both of the database management systems accept XML. That's a key point All right, because not all database management systems are going to actually accept that so just be aware of that. Now SOAP uh, is basically the final piece of the jigsaw. SOAP is a standard that allows XML to run between computers connected together. Now one thing that I'm going to say about database systems remember that there were three so SOAP, oh sorry I'll come back to this, SOAP is basically uh, a link between computers to connect it to the internet so that you don't have to uh, necessarily have all of your database located on one computer so you can actually use the internet to actually call on information and this tends to be used a lot with things like JavaScript. Now one thing I'm going to do because I haven't got all the information I want here is I'm going to type some more. Now these are some other things that you may want to write down on the back of databases. So one thing that you need to be aware of is that there are different types of databases. Remember that a record is a single unit of information in a database. It is normally made up of fields. All right. So a student file would be made up of many records. So you might have Ray Chambers 30 240886 Jennifer Hannah 24 22 uh, I've obviously worked that out wrong, but the idea is that a record is the whole piece of information and the field is just the actual the, the, the key information, the attribute if you like. Okay, uh, We've also got different types. Remember you have a flat file. All the information is in a single table. It's organized so that all of the information is in a single file slash table. Now what this brings with it is it brings data redundancy. So I could accidentally, if I need to do Ray Chambers 30 order Ray Chambers 30 I'm repeating the data over and over again and I might accidentally have an inconsistency in my piece of data. So that's the problem with flat files. Now that's why we create something called relational databases. Okay, Relational databases mean that there is an entity. Now an entity is a real, real world object that is modeled in the database. It might be a physical object such as a student or a stock item in a shop. 
alright? The relationship can be through the relation, I'll just say that, alright? It's a relation, so you might have a primary key, but the secondary key links the, not the secondary key, the foreign key links the information together. All right. The idea of using a relation or database is that data is stored in separate tables. So what I could have here is I could have one table that's got name, let's go, this might be easier. So I've got a table called room. This is in a hotel, which has got room number, date, room type, and customer reference. Now I've got a customer table which is got customer ref, first name, second name, address, postcode. But what we've got here is we've got the foreign key. The foreign key is customer ref. Customer ref. Okay. And the reason for that is because it links them together. All right. Now, I can look up the customer reference and find their information in the other table. So this makes it relational. So I'm hoping you're starting to see why we use that now. Tables are that have a field repeated in another table. That is called the foreign key. Now sometimes we can have a secondary key. So for example, you might need to find another piece of information. Think about when you have a, a bank, okay? Uh, you may forget all your details. So what they do is they get all of that information from you. Uh, they might ask you your age, date of birth, your address, and that will bring up all that information combined together will bring your information up. Now we use databases with relational data uh, bases, sorry, we use that to avoid data redundancy okay data redundancy is unnecessary repetition of data all right it can be avoided by creating a relationship all right so that is a quick whiz stop on databases, all right? Now, I want to know if there are any quick questions on that. So let's have a look. Um, seem to have a few um, people that want to play Minecraft on here, rather. Any of my students that are here for revision uh, have any questions on that? <laughs> Otherwise, I will go on to the next thing. No? Okay, I will move on. All right. So the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, one of the things that you said you'd like to know about is compression. So I'm going to go through lossy uh, compression. So remember, compression is needed because over the years, we've had to trans transmit even more information. Um, but because internet speeds are increasing, our file sizes are also increasing. So we still need to reduce the size of them. All right. Uh, so when picking a compression method, we need to think about bandwidth, we need to think about file storage, and there are two strategies available. So the first one was lossy. Lossy removes the data, all right, so that the original file can be uh, basically made a lot smaller. Sometimes it has uh, the it has an impact on the quality. So for example, a video you might notice start getting all squarey. So it removes the data and and the sound or the video, the quality will go. 
Now lossy is generally found in MP4, MPEG, JPEG or MP3 and it is unnoticeable to the human scent. But what you need to make sure that you comment on is that it may have an impact on the quality and you need to make sure that you acknowledge that some of the data is removed, all right? And the other thing is, you can't actually, once you remove the data from it with lossy, you can't put it back, all right? So that's one thing, you can't convert backwards. Uh, then you've, uh, the other thing, uh, so it removes the data that isn't important. So you might use it for a photograph that's been sent to you with a high resolution. Uh, you might, uh, see reduction in terms of the color depth, uh, you may, might notice that sound waves are not sampled as much and I gave you this example before showing you of what happens to the image so the more lossy compression you do to that the more it kind of you start to notice the quality diminish. Now lossless is where you cannot afford to remove any of the information alright so for example uh, the file is recreated in such a way that you need to use a compression algorithm that keeps all of the original information. So you need to make sure, for example, if I've got a file here, I'm going to type this. All right. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I might create a compression algorithm that that basically says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, three, nine, six, seven, eight, four, five. And to, and basically what that would do is it would strip out the words that are repeated such as uh, ask, all right, so that wouldn't be there again, all right, and you would see just the numbers and it would map them so that all the information comes back so you can convert it to and from. That's just an example of me trying to get across my point. Basically, you would use lossless on things such as uh, computer programs, text files, uh, basically where you cannot afford to lose the data. So that's my example there. I've got a dictionary, and I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, three, nine, six, seven. So there's like a dictionary of all the information. Now, compression formats that are used for lossless include GIF for images, ZIPs for archives, and PNGs for image, generally used for programming. Now, uh, any quick questions there? No. Right, moving on. So then we have ASCII. So remember that all data that, that we transmit on our computer systems are stored in binary. Now, there's lots of ways of representing data, but in order for the computer to represent text, we use ASCII, which is an 8-bit binary code. There are 7 bits used, plus 1 for the parity bit. And what I mean by parity all right, is that this bit is usually used to check if the data has come in accurately. So ASCII allows us to have 128 characters. All right. Now, the other thing that we have is Unicode. Now, ASCII wasn't big enough all right, to actually get that information. So what it actually had to do when we started using bigger like things from other countries, we need to represent other symbols that aren't available. So what we had to do is fit it into 16 bits. And this allowed us to have 65,000 characters. So in an exam question you need to acknowledge that more characters are available using 16 bits. So uh, here's an example of the file size you'd have. So you would have 11 bytes here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Because a space also counts as a character. So that will help you to kind of understand. 
Now the way that it works, in fact I haven't explained this, so I'm going to add this in, all right, is each character represents a numeric numeric code. All right? So it ha it has a deanery value. This is converted into binary mapped against the ASCII it doesn't want to accept that but that should be two eyes all right maps against the ASCII table all right and then the character is shown all right so that gives you an idea uh, I hope that's been useful still don't appear to have any questions yet so I'm just going to continue uh, ah, this one. Right, so there were three different things that we went through that people said that they wanted me to cover and they weren't sure about. So first one was paging. Paging is when the operating system uses the memory and it splits it into blocks. Let me fix that. Fits it into blocks that are all the same size. So if you imagine, look at a book, all your pages are the same size, yeah? And for example, it could be seven kilobytes. So your your program or your process, all right, your process is split into equal pages. Yeah, that means that the operating system uses a page table to keep track of where the pages are stored, and it's easier for it to access and go backwards and forwards. Now, what segmentation does is it sets aside the memory. So segmentation actually means that each process has its own size. So if I was to just draw this here, uh, if I uh, show you, so th if you imagine this is program A and program B, that's segmentation, but paging would be all your processes are stored in a page table and it's split across the memory into equal chunks. Do you see where I'm going with that? So that's the main difference between page. So this would be segmentation, this would be paging. So that segments are not fixed in size and so that the information and processes can come back together, that each segment is fit into what the stack is, so what segment it is, what free memory is available, the data and the code, and that's how it knows, all right? Then, <coughs> thrashing is the one that you all struggled with. So when the RAM is running low, virtual memory is used on the hard disk, all right? So the virtual memory is used. Um, so it uses the hard disk as secondary memory to store the information from the RAM. Okay. Now, when it doesn't need the information, any, when you've got a process and you don't need the information anymore, the operating system moves it back to out of the RAM into the virtual memory. And then when it is needed again, it's moved back into the RAM. So if you've got a process, imagine it's moving it from the virtual memory into the RAM, virtual memory into the RAM, and it keeps doing this to go and get key information it needs, this can slow down your computer. Because it's moving backwards and forth between the physical and the virtual memory, it slows down your computer, and this is called disk thrashing. All right, and some of you said that you wanted me to go over that. All right. Now, the last thing I'm going to go over is networks. I hope that this session has been useful just to kind of jog your memory. All right. And I'm going to dictate this. So I hope that you can watch this back. And I'm going to go over some of my notes from previous sessions. Okay. So let's Okay, so we have networks on a on a day-to-day -day basis, all right, and we need these because 
we need to be able to store information. We need to make sure that our information isn't isn't basically out there on the World Wide Web. But we use networks so that we can communicate and share data better. So we use networks are used so that we can share and communicate information better. Okay. Uh, what it also means is that we can have private networks which give us control over security. We have complete control over what access other people can get, control over the software, and control over what is available to people. All right. Now, one thing that you need to remember uh, for this is we have different topologies. The first one we had is a bus and key things to remember about the bus is that it has a backbone uh, and it's usually made of copper wire and a drawback of this is if the backbone breaks whole network fails. Okay so remember that uh, and that network diagram is just a simple line with some nodes attached to it so it would look like this. Uh, I'm going to draw that for you. What I'd recommend is connecting at least three computers to it. All right. And yeah, so imagine that there are computers there, okay? The other disadvantage that you've got is more computers, more traffic slows down the network, okay? That's the thing about bus. Uh, then you also have a star, all right? The star uh, that uses hubs or switches as linking devices in the middle allows us to connect multiple servers. It's common to be used in most networks. If server fails in the middle, network goes down. But if you have to update a PC, no downtime on the network. All right. You've also got a ring. Don't know why I just wrote wrong there. You've also got a ring, which all data goes in one direction, stops data collisions, and it allows each computer to be connected to each other. Uh, requires lots of cables, as does the star network lots of cables. All right, so that can be expensive, all right? Now, remember we have the terms LAM, local area network, which is a a network of computers. Remember to say a network of computers connected together in a small geographical area. WAN wide area network a network of computers connected together in a large geographical area. All right, so you need to know the difference between the two. Remember, we also had a SAN, which is a storage area network, a PAN, personal area network, MAN, metropolitan, politan, ah. Politan area network. All right. So SAN is used for storage. PAN is where you've got your personal devices connected together, and MAN is a metropolitan area network. Okay. Now remember, we have different types of network models. All right. You have the client-server model. Client-server model. That was where you had, in fact, I may have 
a diagram of that. Remember we did this before as well, I recommend going back over this, it's on the... Okay, so... Explain what is meant by client-server model. The client-server model has a central server which supplies a service, such as a web server, to clients connecting it. Now, what it looks like is, I will just show you. I will have, I'm going to use these shapes as my computers. I've got my clients, one, two, three. I've got my clients that connect to the network and the network can then connects to our server. So I'm going to add text, server, network. All right, so these are the clients. They would, in turn, send a request to the network. The network would then go to the server to check whether it's allowed that. And then the server, if I go hit show you, insert shape, then the server then responds to the network and uh, again the network sends that response to the client so that's the client server model okay now then you also have peer to peer basically this is where all computers are connected together now the thing about this is that no computer has priority all computers have equal status. Peer-to-peer -peer is used for file sharing and in some cases illegal file sharing. All right. Then we also have the TCP slash IP stack. Remember that you had the application layer which is where you're using your programs basically then the network layer and the physical layer all right now the open osi model all right the open osi model uh, let, sorry i didn't explain the network layer doesn't care about what data is transmitted it's concerned with the la layout of the network okay the physical layer is the the cables that are involved okay it cares about the journey basically remember then we had the OSI model I'll go back to that uh, where there were seven layers OSI model you had application which is basically using the program which is layer seven and we're going to go six five four three two one uh, presentation, which looks after conversion of data into the format it needs to be. Then session, so it, it, it looks at whether it's uh, starting or starting or terminating the connection. Transport, how it gets there, keeping track of the segments on the network network data packets data link which is access uh, error detection and physical which is transmission media now some things remember you need to know the difference between uh, packet switching alright so packet switching is where packet switching is where the packet is split up 
slash data is split into packets finds the quickest route all right so what it would do is it would use any route available all right breaks data into something called packets now remember circuit switching this establishes establishes one connection it's a fixed connection before the information is sent now the good thing about packet switching is that it can ask for the missing packet again if the connection is dropped on circuit switching the whole file needs to be called again you need an extremely liable connection for using circuit switching okay uh, remember DNS which is domain name server basically you type in the domain name like google.com alright it then goes to the domain name server and locates the IP address of the page if it can't find that IP address it will go to another domain name server until it finds the IP address it needs if it finds that IP address the page is loaded via the internet browser so for example here you've got insert if I go to a table domain name IP address you might have google.com and then 192.16 uh, yeah all right all right so what if it couldn't find it in this domain name server it would go and find it in another one